Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. It's always twice you have to say good afternoon or good morning, I find, to groups. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, it's good. Uh, I, ask, I asked that question partly because I was giving a talk in Tokyo a few years ago and I started by saying, can you hear me? And there was complete silence in the room. And I had one of these tie mics on, so I played with the buttons a bit. I said a bit louder, can you hear me? and still in Tokyo, complete silence. And so I go as close as I can, I shout as loud as I can to the audience, can you hear me? Still in Tokyo, complete silence. Except for the Japanese professor who was sitting at the front somewhere and he said to me very quietly, Andy, they can hear you, they just can't understand you. Um, it was not a great time, uh, a start to my talk in Tokyo. I hope we don't have that problem today. Uh, I hope the things I say make sense. Uh, but if they don't, feel free to challenge them, feel free to question them. I'm very happy to uh, engage in a debate about this topic of how do we understand uh, the value of data inside organisations and how do we start to think about data uh, as an asset. And the reason I'm, uh, I've got into this is over the years, I've, I started my career looking at uh, manufacturing uh, businesses, and particularly in manufacturing businesses, how do you measure the performance of a manufacturing business, not just from a financial perspective, but also from a non-financial perspective, and make sure you get the right balance of metrics inside organisations. Now, when I started, um, that was quite a long time ago, you can tell by the, uh, the grey hair. Um, uh, when I started that work, there was already interest in data and how we might access data and so on, but it was a much more challenging setup, if you like, inside organisations. I remember talking to somebody a few years ago in a large pharmaceutical firm, and we were discussing the challenges of how they measured something as simple as the number of employees they have inside the organisation. They said, well, one of the challenges we face is that we've got 27 different definitions of what an employee is around the world. So in some countries, employees work full-time, they count as employees. In other countries, we add up the part-time employees to make full-time equivalent. In others, we count contractors. In others, we don't count contractors. And so depending on which of our definition of an employee uh, you use, that affects uh, the number you'd get of how many people work inside this organisation. Now you'd think that should be a trivial thing to be able to answer how many people work somewhere and yet even that's complicated uh, sometimes for firms. But if you come to the world today and you think about what's going on in organisations and the way that uh, the Internet of Things, um, Industry 4.0, uh, the data that's now available, it's just fundamentally changing the way that manufacturing operates. And so the first thing that I was interested in is how manufacturing is changing and how data enables that change. The more you look at that leads to a second question, which is really about then, well, how do I understand uh, whether the firms that we are thinking about are working on the right things? Um, so in the days when what really mattered is the product you produced, and that was what you thought about in your manufacturing firm. Imagine you're making planes, you worry about the planes. But if you're Rolls-Royce, increasingly the data that comes off the engine is as important in some ways as the asset. In fact, Rolls remotely monitor their engines when they're in flight, they're getting real-time data back on the state of the engine so they can make predictions about whether or not they need to repair engines when planes land at their destination. Um, and so suddenly the data becomes an incredibly valuable asset in the organisation. And yet in many of our firms, the thing that we often focus on is the physical, the tangible asset rather than the data asset. So how do we make sense of that data asset? And that's really what led to this work around how you value data. And that's what I want to just expand on a little bit today. So I thought I'd start with just talking a little bit about the way I see the world changing and just some examples really from different types of organisations. So one particular uh, firm that I've done a lot of work with recently is Caterpillar. So Caterpillar, uh, many people will know, you'll have seen uh, big yellow trucks beside the road or if anyone's been to a quarry, uh, big yellow trucks in quarries, they do bulldozers, etc, etc. Um, What's interesting about Caterpillar is their business model used to be uh, seed, grow, harvest. And so the idea was um, seed was all about um, creating fantastic new products. A lot of money on new product development. Uh, they'd develop new engines, uh, new fuels, etc., etc. Um, and their 
Then the grow piece was about getting as many people as possible to uh, use the machines, to have a big installed base. And harvest, the place that Caterpillar made all of its money, and this is true of many manufacturing firms, uh, was in the spare parts and consumables. So effectively, if you pay a million dollars for a truck, uh, normally you would expect over the course of the life of the truck to pay about $4 million in terms of spare parts and consumables. And the value or the margin on the spare parts and consumables is about 10 times the margin on the original truck. Um, now, the numbers vary a little bit by country and so on, but very crudely, that's a, a way of thinking about it. So for Caterpillar, the more trucks they get out there or the more of their equipment they get out there being used, the really important thing for them is then to maintain a relationship with the customer and make sure they have the contract to service and support the machine. The, one of the ways they do that increasingly is all of the data and the sensors that come back from the machines. And that's becoming more important to them because the margins have been so good in the spare parts business, traditionally, uh, increasingly other competitors are coming into that market and nibbling away at the spare parts business. And so Caterpillar is having to think, well, how do we build deeper relationships with our customers? So one of the ways they do that is all the data that's on the machine. So if you take a, a truck like this one, um, this is uh, the, the, the number of sensors on here is just enormous. And they're tracking engine pe pressure, temperature, um, oil pressure, uh, pressure in the tires, weight of material in the bed of the truck, GPS position, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things you can do with all of that data, if you're gathering all of that insight, is you can start to then offer a service to the customer and say, rather than buying the truck, you want to buy an outcome. And if you're running a quarry, the outcome you want is to minimize the cost of production in your quarry. You want to maximize productivity. If I can take the data, so Caterpillar enters into a contract now with customers where they say, uh, rather than buy the truck, we will guarantee that you can run your quarry and it will cost you $30 per ton um, to extract mineral from the quarry, let's say. They're then using the data to help optimize production in the quarry. So just a simple example, if you imagine a truck uh, up against a rock face, so here's the rock face. Um, we know when the truck is full because the scales in the bed of the truck tell us it's full. Um, if the GPS position doesn't start moving immediately as soon as the truck's full, that's lost production time at the quarry. And so for cats, um, they, they're taking that data, they're then looking at where they can see ways of improving productivity in the individual quarry, feeding that back to customers, making the quarry more efficient, and then entering a gain share mechanism for the, with the customer, where if they make the quarry more efficient, CAT get 50% of the savings and the customer gets 50% of the savings, all enabled by data. So it's a fundamentally different business model. And if you go to an organization like Caterpillar, it's full of engineers who for years I often joke with them that if you cut someone in Caterpillar in half, they would bleed yellow. They love their big yellow trucks, and they think it's all about the truck. And yet increasingly, it's about the data and the insight that they get from the data to allow them to deliver value to their customers. Different example, if you take someone like um, the, the picture here, education. So Pearson. Pearson, most people think of as a publisher. Um, and yet, if you're in the world of published textbooks, uh, that's not a great market to be in. It's all going online, it will all go digital at some stage. Uh, and so the interesting challenge for an organization like Pearson is how quickly do we disrupt the market um, and how quickly do we move to a digital uh, online version of our service rather than selling uh, printed books. Uh, if we do it too fast, disrupt the market too quickly, we lose some uh, potential value in the market because there were books to be sold. If we do it too slowly, uh, we'll get left behind. And you could argue, particularly in the US, Pearson is getting left behind and not doing enough digital disruption. If you go to an online version with education materials, so real example now, one of the services that um, the publishers are offering to faculty, or talking about offering to faculty, is saying to faculty and universities, rather than you um, creating or, or recommending a single textbook to your students, what we, re, what we will do is we'll allow you to create a customized uh, digital set of learning materials for your students. So I can go to Pierce and I can say, I'm gonna teach a bit about um, supply chain, so I'd like chapter two from Nigel Slack's book, and I'm gonna teach a bit about 
uh, quality management, so I like chapter seven from Terry Hill's book, and I like those three FT articles that came out recently, I like those two videos that are on the BBC website, I like those Harvard cases, and Pearson will create for me a set of uh, digital materials for my course that I'm teaching. Uh, they then come back to the faculty and they say, well, we know what you're teaching because we know you've got chapter two and that's about supply chains and chapter seven, that's about quality. And we've got online tests that we can give your students, if you like, uh, to test whether they've learned the knowledge they need to learn in connection with supply chains or quality. Now, in my job, one of the most boring things I have to do, and I'm sure uh, people in the room who work in universities will appreciate this, apologies to any students who are in the room, but one of the most boring things that faculty have to do is mark student scripts. Uh, and the reason it's dull is if you've got 350 engineers and you set an exam question, marking the first two or three is quite interesting, but by the time you get to number 10, it gets a bit repetitive. And if you've got 340 to go, it really is dull. So if someone says, we'll mark it for you, that's fantastic. So Pearson come along and say, you can use the online test and we'll do the marking. So then you say to Pearson, right, please mark for me. Um, but then the interesting thing is that allows Pearson, of course, to get insight into the way that students perform in tests and those that don't do very well, how they perform in retests. So then Pearson say, well, now we can start to build a relationship directly with the individual student um, and we can advise students. We can say, we've seen people who've taken tests like your, you before. Um, you didn't do very well on uh, the question two and other students that didn't do well on question two did much better in the retest when they looked at uh, this chapter and watch this video rather than read that book. So we recommend you go off and um, read this chapter, watch this video, and then do the retest. So Pearson starting to learn, both build a relationship directly with the student, very important in terms of lifelong learning, but also using the data that's coming back from the online testing to allow them to customize the service they offer much more closely to the students. And actually, I'd argue, if you look at any industry at the moment and think about the way that data is transforming that industry or has the potential to do it, you can see examples all over the place, whether you think about healthcare or uh, entertainment, Netflix, or leisure, TripAdvisor, um, Uber, the way we use taxis. Effectively, Uber thinks about itself running a market now. Fundamentally, data is transforming all of those organizations, and yet often we don't really think about data uh, that carefully. Um, you can look at this at a very aggregate level. So if you look at the world's most valuable companies, if you go back to 2013, it's surprising how quick this uh, change is happening, really. If you go back to 2013, uh, you can see some of the examples of the world's most uh, valuable companies. So ExxonMobil, um, Petrochemicals, GE, um, very diversified industrial conglomerate, uh, Johnson Johnson, uh, PetroChina, and so on. Um, if you look at 2019, so now that same set, and the world's most valuable companies, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, uh, Alibaba, the, the preponderance of data-based uh, or digital companies is just growing enormously. And in fact, there was an article out in the FT earlier on this week which quoted some work uh, that says that now 80% um, of the world's corporate wealth re resides in just 10% of firms many of which are based in Silicon Valley. So that both consolidation of corporate wealth and changing nature of the type of firm that creates wealth has become uh, very important. And if you think about that um, over the long term, actually this is not a new phenomenon. So although I just referred to data from 2013 to 19, um, if you go back over a period of time, if you get back to sort of 75, um, at that stage, when you looked at what created the value, looked at stock market value of firms and underlying assets that were being valued, uh, something like 83% of the firm's value lay in the tangible assets, the physical assets, and about 17% at that point lay in the intangible assets. Since 75, year after year after year, what we've seen is the intangible assets becoming more and more important in terms of how stock markets uh, value firms. What do we mean by intangible assets? Well, you can think about it in a number of ways. I mean, the classic ways of brand, IP, uh, goodwill, and so on. But increasingly, I would argue that one of the intangible assets we have to think about much, much more explicitly in organizations is this question of data. 
And if you think about data and start to say, well, where, you know, what are the different types of data that might be valuable to organizations? You hear a number uh, of examples in this conference, data around what customers I've got, what they're buying from me, take Caterpillar, the database of their install base, where their equipment is, is incredibly valuable to the organization. The condition of the machine, if I'm remotely monitoring the way in which you are using your car, for example, uh, and I can track that you drive your car re really sensibly uh, and don't over rev the engine and so on, that's got implications in terms of the residual value of the car because I know you haven't stressed the engine, therefore your cars like to have a longer life. If I'm a financing company and I know you are someone who hasn't overstressed the engine of your car and therefore end up with a car that's got a higher residual value, you're a better bet to lend money to in the future than somebody who always stresses the engine of their car, etc., etc. So um, you can think about loads of different types of data in organisations and how that creates or has the potential uh, to create value. And the argument then is that actually we should think about, in lots of organisations, certainly in my role, um, we often see data as a bit of a problem. We worry about how do we get the quality right, how do we get the governance right, our databases are messy, they're expensive to maintain, we've got, um, I gave the farmer example of 27 uh, different definitions of what an employee is, that's a data uh, problem. Often when you talk to people, they talk about data as a problem, whereas if you flip the lens and you say, well actually what we really need to think about is data as an asset, you end up with a very different conversation uh, in the organisation. And so effectively the exam question um, is this one of how would we value data? How do we start to think about valuing data as an asset in an organisation? So let me try and um, uh, make that a, a, a bit more practical. I'm, I'm just going to do a sort of short case study to explain how we've uh, tried to do this. And the, um, the initial thing uh, to think about I think when you're thinking about valuing data is actually you have to think about it through the, the potentially the eyes of the users of the data. So take retail data. Um, you know, lots of us will have uh, frequent um, uh, Tesco club cards and so on. The amount those organizations know about us uh, is, uh, is scary. There's a lovely story actually from Target in the US <coughs> where Target um, are using shopping pattern data to make predictions about whether, whether or not people are pregnant. Um, and the story in the US is that a father went into a Target store, uh, really cross one day and complained to the manager and said, I'm really annoyed, you, you've just sent my daughter who's at college uh, vouchers for baby products and you really shouldn't be sending her these vouchers. And the manager apologized and said, I'm really, uh, really sorry, uh, we shouldn't have done that. Father came back in the store about a week later and said, I'd like to talk to the manager, and then said, I have to apologize to you. I came in last week and ranted at you about sending my daughter vouchers for baby products. I've had a chat with her, and it turns out she is actually pregnant, uh, and you were right. I just didn't know at the time, um, <clears throat> which is kind of scary when we live in a world where Target knows your daughter's pregnant before you are. Um, there are lots of ethical challenges around this as well uh, that we could, uh, we could debate at some stage. Um, but the point is that if you think about retail data, from a, from a retailer, clearly knowing what's been sold has enormous implications in terms of managing stock. How do I, how do I make sure the right things are in uh, the store? For marketing, knowing what's being sold or who's buying what um, allows you to target offers much better. We all get this on Amazon where people like you buy, uh, who buy books like this also buy books like that and so on. Um, and then for insurers, uh, and this is where some of the ethical uh, boundaries really come in, so insurers, knowing what people buy and therefore what families consume in terms of foods, you could start to impute some information around individuals' lifestyle and diet, which then has health implications. So I can make better predictions about uh, how much the premium should be for particular families. That's, I think, where some of the really challenging ethical questions come in. That one of my favorite examples there is from the banking sector. So I was talking to somebody in the bank recently who was saying that they, from credit card spending patterns, uh, have worked out that they can predict about three months in advance uh, of when a couple is going to split up. Um, and the reason for that is if you think about what happens, if the relationship's uh, not going well, you get different patterns of spending on the credit card. So one partner goes to Paris for the weekend, other goes to Milan for the weekend, they stay in different hotels, they eat in different restaurants, etc., etc. Um, 
Now, for a bank, couples splitting up is a nightmare because if they split up and they've got a joint mortgage, you've got to separate the account, um, you've got to separate the mortgage. It's a really costly process. So banks would much prefer, once you've uh, got into a relationship with somebody, particularly for a joint account, uh, that you stay in the relationship. So it raises an interesting question for the bank. Should they try and intervene and offer uh, relationship guidance uh, counselling? Vouchers to take your partner out for a nice meal? Um, they've decided they're not going to do that. And in fact, they've decided they're not going to keep doing that analysis. It's too intrusive. And we, will, we have already, and we'll continue to see examples, where, where organisations overstep the line. The Google uh, conversation this week about, or last week about health is a really good example, where organisations overstep the line and provoke an allergic reaction from society at large about what they can do with their data. But there's all sorts of uh, different people that matter. Uh, but the first thing it seems to me in terms of valuing data, you've got to do it through the eyes of the stakeholder. You can't just look at it from the organisation's perspective. But a bit like Caterpillar, you've got to say, what is it that the quarry operator would value? They would value optimization of my quarry. How can my data help uh, that quarry operator? The implication of that, or one of the implications of that, is often we talk about data lakes uh, and pooling all the data together inside the organization and thinking about it as an amorphous mass. Um, I think that's not, when it comes to valuation, that's really an unhelpful way of thinking. And in many ways, it's much, much better to think about data pools and say, actually, the different uh, individual pools of data that we have inside the organization has, have different amounts of value to different stakeholders. And actually, what really matters is understanding the, the relative value of these pools. Because if I understand the relative value of the pools, I can start to understand where I should invest inside the organization. Um, whereas if I just look at data as an amorphous mass, it's really difficult to make any choices uh, around investment. So, uh, trying to make it even more practical. So this is something we've been doing with Highways England recently and saying, well, let's think about this in a uh, Highways England, incredibly asset intense business. Uh, for those that don't know Highways England, uh, basically Highways England is the organization uh, publicly funded uh, government organisation that looks after the road network, so all of the motorways, all of the A roads uh, around the UK. Um, total network is about 4,300 miles, um, and that represents, as you can see on the slide here, about 2% of the roads in England by length, because there's lots of smaller country roads, B roads and so on, um, but although it's only 2% of the roads by length, they carry about a third of the road traffic in the UK. So all of the big motorways, uh, all of the big uh, um, uh, A roads. And they're investing about 15 billion uh, in updating, maintaining, improving those roads. So increasing capacity of the M25 or the A14, all of those kind of conversations are highways, uh, England conversations. They also, um, I mean, if you think about an organisation like Highways England, and if you think your purpose is to build and maintain the road network, you tend to be very physical asset focused. Uh, and you tend to worry about, you know, do we need to put another lane on the M25 or the A14? And how would, you, how would we evaluate which is going to be the best uh, for the country? Um, but actually, increasingly, they also generate significant, amount, significant amounts of data, both themselves and through their partner network. So we have data on traffic flows, how fast uh, traffic's flowing. We have data on where the roadworks are, where accidents have happened, where the diversions have been, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and one of the problems they face is that data is not managed in a particularly coordinated or uh, consistent way either within the organization or between Highways England uh, and other organizations. So that really led to the challenge um, uh, for us and the challenge for us was really thinking about how do we communicate the value and therefore the importance of data to the wider business. It's all very well if you take the data scientist they know data matters, if you take the chief data officer he knows data matters, it is a him in Highways England. Um, but actually, if you talk to the finance people and you go and say data is important, they just go, well, prove it. Show me what's the value on this. So how do I get a language that I can communicate uh, across the business? And so the way that we set about this was really a five-step uh, process. So the first thing was to ask something about what's the economic value that Highways England creates. Highways England is not, um, uh, there's not a market. It's, so you can't look at the market capitalization. 
but we know the infrastructure creates some value for the UK. So how do we understand the economic value of the entire infrastructure? The second thing was to understand, uh, we call them value drivers, but what are the initiatives that Highways England is undertaking to try and create more value? The third thing was to understand the underlying data sets and the role um, of those data sets in supporting those different initiatives. And that leads into this idea of data dependency. So how dependent are particular initiatives on a data set? And then on the back of that, you can start to think about the overall value of the data that exists inside Highways England. Now, this is not a precise science. I mean, it's not uh, uh, there are, um, uh, and it's important to make explicit here some of the assumptions that get made in the valuation. It's like any accounting exercise. It's it's, um, it's not a, it's never a precise science. So I'll I'll try and just unpack how we went through each of those steps. Uh, so the first thing, in terms of data, uh, or sorry, economic value. The way we thought about that was saying, actually, if you looked at the physical asset value, so you look at the road network in the UK, um, a value of 115 billion has been put on that set of physical assets. Um, that's partly replacement cost, it's partly the construction cost uh, of the assets. There's then a, um, a, a factor, so in something called the RIS, uh, the in investment strategy, there's um, a cost-benefit analysis that basically has uh, looked at the value created for all of the people who use the roads by having access to those roads. And the, and the, the shorthand is that for every pound invested in physical infrastructure, 2.7 pounds, uh, so 2 pounds 70 are, are created in, um, if you like, additional value. So the total value that the Highways England, the economic value of Highways England is 311 billion pounds. Um, and of course, the difference between the physical assets and the, um, uh, and the total um, value created is effectively the intangible value that exists. So at an aggregate level, the, the what saying is that there's about 196, just under 200 billion of intangible value that Highways England creates by having the road network. Uh, and some of that has to be related to the data that Highways England has. So that was the first step. The second step was then to start to say, well, let's think about all of the initiatives that exist inside something like Highways England and how are, um, what impact are they having? So if you take, um, and particularly from the perspective of different stakeholders. So if you think about a big stakeholder for Highways England, logistics and distribution firms, uh, or the retail sector, enormous users of the road network, what they really care about is when they send stuff from their warehouse, the Tesco warehouse to the local Tesco store, they don't want it to get held up, they want it to get there on time, they're managing their inventories so that as stuff is going off the shelves, new stuff is arriving, so it's a very just-in-time uh, type process. And so roadworks or traffic jams are a complete nightmare. So for someone like a logistics uh, or a distribution company, Having advanced warning of where there may dis be disruptions on roads is a really crucial issue. Uh, having real-time notice on when something's happened. So last night I was in London, the Victoria Line was broken. It would have been really helpful to know that the Victoria Line was broken when I'd got off the train uh, as, that came into King's Cross before I went down into the underground rather than finding out when I got down on the platform because um, that was it would that slightly uh, earlier warning for me would allow me to change the journey I was planning to take last night logistics and transport's the same um, the, uh, the the ports so ports worry about queues. We might experience this depending on, I won't go into a Brexit rant, um, uh, but uh, ports may well find that actually the way that we control junctions and traffic flows off motorways is going to become rather important uh, in the future. So getting insight into what's happening in the junctions becomes crucial for those organisations. And then there's the whole smart motorways. This has been a bit controversial recently, but smart motorways and allowing people to better predict their journey time. So there's a load of initiatives that Highways England are taking. And so the, first, the second step, if you like, was to understand uh, those different initiatives. The third step was then to say, okay, let's now think about what data exists inside Highways England um, and how, uh, so this is back to the data pools. What are the individual data sets they've got? There's about 26 uh, of them, major ones in Highways England. Um, and uh, they may well link to the, the 27 key initiatives that were identified in the previous stage. So let's understand the data sets and something as well about the quality, the robustness of the data sets, how they're governed, etc. 
The fourth piece is then to do this link between the data set and the initiative. And so this was very much discussion with Highways England, where we're going through workshops with them and thinking about actually, let's take the smart motorway uh, activity. How dependent is that activity on uh, the um, uh, the real-time traffic flow uh, on the motorway. How dependent is it on predictions about where roadworks are going to be? So you get some sense of de data dependency. And then the final thing is to then work out the overall data value um, from those dependencies. And so you can end up, in Highways England case, uh, where we got to was saying that actually, when you look at all of the different data sets and you think about their impact on the initiatives and the, initi the, the initiatives impact on value that's likely to be created for the, the, um, uh, the stakeholders, the data in Highways England is valued at about 39 billion uh, pounds. That's about 30% of their tangible physical asset value. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, figure in a second. And you can see the top five data sets account for about a third of the total value. So it's not that they're all equally important. There are some data sets that become really crucial uh, for the organization. That's important. So the, the, the chart on the side here is showing the different data sets. That's important because when you start to then, as a CDO, you go back to the finance office and you say, right, I need a hundred million pound investment in a data set. The, you've now got a language where you can say, actually, I need that investment to improve the quality of that particular data set. Let's say the strategic road network data set. I need to improve the quality of that data set because it underpins 16 of the different initiatives that we're taking. If we get those initiatives right, we know that we can increase overall value Highways England creates by uh, 20%. So you can do a cost-benefit analysis of the investment on the data set, and you can contrast that with the cost-benefit analysis on investment in building or extending a road. So if I got better data on managing traffic flows on road, I might find I don't need to put another lane on the A14 and cause all the disruption. I could just better manage the road through the use of data. And you can start to have those, uh, those conversations. So at a, at a sort of very uh, localized level, think about this in terms of um, environmental data. So one of the evaluations we're doing was looking at uh, CO2 emissions. And you can think about the stakeholders, so the public at large, uh, interest and in environment. Uh, one of the initiatives to reduce CO2 is uh, variable speed limits and how you control, therefore, traffic flows. Uh, you can start to look at the impact of these different initiatives on reducing CO2. So this is the ov overall CO2 levels. Predicted impact of those uh, reductions in CO2. And we can put a value on those uh, reductions in CO2. You can then work out the, de the dependency of each of these initiatives on the data, and that's really how you get the overall data value for the individual data set linked to the initiative, and that's what you're effectively adding up. Why, why does that matter, and, and what, did, what did we learn with Highways England in doing this? I think the first thing <clears throat> was that when we started, a lot of the data in Highways England was uh, very siloed, um, sort of sparsely populated, uh, very complex independent data sets, um, not really owned by people. So one of the reasons, go back to the point about data as a problem rather than an asset, one of the reasons data is a problem is because people don't really feel they own it, they don't really look after it very sensibly. When they started to go, well actually our data is worth 39 billion, they suddenly said, well if you've got an asset worth 39 billion, you pay some attention to that and you start to look after it much more seriously. Uh, and so you overcome some of the, the problems around ownership, if you like, and uh, uh, quality of the data. The other, the other, thing, um, that, the, the other thing that came at a, at a more uh, pragmatic level of Highways England is a series of questions this starts to provoke. So uh, just some examples. If you think about, if, if my data is worth 30% of the total uh, assets of the firm, uh, combination of physical and data assets, then I should be asking a question, as a management team or as a leadership team, am I spending, uh, for every three hours I spend talking about physical assets, am I spending an hour talking about the data assets? So is the balance of effort and conversation in the organisation right, or do I find, a bit like my Caterpillar example, in Caterpillar, they love the big yellow trucks so much, they spend all their time talking about the big yellow trucks, and yet, yet that's not where the future of the business lies. Um, so uh, have I got the balance of time and effort right? The second one, uh, the second one is about <coughs> financial investment. Think about the investment cases. 
So in Highways England, one of the things that came out of this was they started to say, well, we can now have a really serious conversation about we want to spend uh, a chunk of money investing uh, in new road capacity, and we want to build a new uh, a third um, lane or a fourth lane on the A14. I keep referring to the A14 because I suffer from it quite a lot living in Cambridge. Um, so we want to build a new lane on the A14. Actually, if we got better, if we got the data that allowed us to manage traffic flows better on there by investing 50 million in the data management systems, we think we wouldn't need to spend the 2 billion on building the extra lane because we've actually got the capacity on the road. It's just that we're not managing it as an asset very well now. So you can have a much better, a much more nuanced conversation about where the investment should be. And if your data assets are worth a third of your total assets or data and physical assets combined, is a third of your investment going into data? And is that the right balance uh, for the organization? So that's the second uh, thing that came out. Uh, the third thing that uh, became quite an interesting discussion was how do you report success? So generally, when we think about assets, uh, we normally think about assets and we think about the depreciation of assets. So think about your car um, or the roads. We put a value, they atrophy over time, they get worth less and less uh, money over time and we have to repair them. Actually, you could argue that data is an asset that shouldn't uh, depreciate, but should it appreciate over time. If I've got better quality data, and if I'm particularly linking it up with other data sets, um, then potentially I can extract more and more value from the data. So rather than just worrying about depreciation, maybe I can worry about the, the appreciation of the asset. And if I understand the value of my data set today, so 39 billion in Highways England case, I can start to say to people, right, one of your key performance indicators is about the total value of our data set. And I want to see that grow from 39 billion to 45 billion uh, next year or 50 billion next year or in five years. So you can have a much more, again, nuanced conversation about the way that we measure success in organization and data doesn't just become a big black hole. Um, I think there's an interesting question about outsourcing. So if you think about the way that people, a fundamental decision that any organization has to make is um, about what it does itself and what it buys in from the marketplace, whether that's services or, in a manufacturing case, uh, components and so on. Um, if that's a fundamental decision for any organization, then um, actually how many organizations think about in their make versus buy decision not just the data, sorry, not just the physical thing they're buying or the service they're buying, but the implications for data and how explicit that is in the, uh, the evaluation. Certainly in the make versus buy conversations, I've just been involved in one recently, uh, where the, uh, the contract was evaluated on uh, technical capability, cultural fit, price, there was no mention at all in the evaluation criteria of data and the data assets that we might create through that particular piece of work. And yet that's a valuable thing to think about, but it's completely blindsided in most of our discussions about make versus buy inside organizations. Um, and then a, a, another one uh, that they talked about a lot was this question of, if my, if my data is worth a third of my uh, total asset value, then let's think about all of the asset management stuff I put in place. If you imagine a, an organization like Highways England, lots of attention on repairing potholes, looking after the roads, uh, resurfacing them, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing like, there's no way a third of their efforts went into managing the data asset versus managing the road asset. And again, if you've got limited resource, maybe you'd be better off putting a bit more time and effort into managing the data asset and a bit less into managing parts of the road asset, particularly if by managing the data asset, you managed to then better use the road, the physical asset. So it provokes, when you start to put a, a, a number on data, as I say, it's not a precise science, but a number on data, at least you can start that conversation in the organization about how do we really think about data uh, as an asset. So where that takes me, just a, a few final uh, observations. I think, uh, first of all, it's clear, and I, I mean, from the examples I gave at the start, data is becoming a more and more uh, valuable asset to all sorts of organizations. People are using it to create uh, competitive advantage, uh, particularly in terms of offering extra value to their stakeholders. To value the data, I think you really need to think about pools, not lakes. You need to think about the data pools and the way that those connect back to your initiatives and the value you're creating for stakeholders. 
Um, that allows you to then understand the d how the data creates value for the stakeholders. But then the consequence of valuing data is these more sophisticated conversations. You start to change the narrative and the discussion inside the organization, um, which in turn allows you just to say, well, have we got this quite right? Is our make versus buy philosophy right? Or is, our, uh, is the way that we spend time correct? Or are our balance of KPIs quite correct for the way that we think about this particular organization? So I hope that was helpful. I hope it gave some uh, useful insights. And I'm very happy if there are questions. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you.